organization, Stand to Reason, STR, that I'm involved with is 21 years old, and we have as a goal to help to train followers of Christ uh, to make a, an attractive but uh, effective defense for Christianity. And one of the things that we have found that as I, and I get to speak at a lot of apologetics conferences in the States, um, there, there's a, a great uh, renaissance of uh, Christian thinking and apologetics in the States, and so there are lots of opportunities for Christians to get, get training in the content and the substance of apologetics. Uh, the problem is, is that in those conferences, there's almost always something missing. When you sit in a conference like you've done for the last few days, you know, it's easy to get the feeling like your brain gets full, you know. And then you wonder, how are you going to take the information that you've gained at these conferences and communicate that in an effective way, get it into play in conversations with other people? And that's what's missing in a lot of these conferences. Uh, the, it's a bridge that's missing. It's a bridge from the content to the conversation, or a bridge from the, say, this, the scholarship to the relationship. Well, that's the kind of thing that I want to provide for you in kind of a, a brief form today. At least we will sketch out what it looks like a little bit um, in actual play. Um, how is it that we engage people in a way that doesn't sound unusual or doesn't sound abrupt or doesn't set us up uh, in a conflict kind of situation? How, how, how do we make our engagements for other people um, look more like diplomacy than D-Day? That's what the tactical approach is about. Now, I need to, to lay a foundation, though, with an idea that's going to probably surprise you. Uh, especially since apologetics is a subset of, uh, of evangelism. Um, here is, and, and what I'm going to say has, has troubled some people uh, that they don't agree with this, but I'm going to stand behind it because I think, um, I think it's sound advice. And here's what that statement is. I never have it as a goal when I get into a conversation that I think will have maybe spiritual uh, impact. I never have it as a goal to lead that person to Christ. In fact, I don't even have it as a goal to, um, to get to the gospel in that conversation. Now, there's a lot of reasons why I don't have enough time to spread it all out, but I just, I'll just i say it simply in this way, and I'm speaking now more from reference to the States, but I'm sure the same situation applies here in Europe. It may be more so. And that is things have changed over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, the, the gospel is no longer simple to people. It isn't like you can just sit down and explain about Jesus and the cross and then people understand it and then they're able to respond to it. Um, no, the people don't, don't, they don't understand what our, our spiritual language means. Even in the states where you have a very, very strong underpinning of, uh, of Christianity uh, historically, still you don't... Uh, and we're much closer to the Christian heritage uh, of our founders than, than you are in Europe. But still, people have now drifted away from this. It's not a uh, Christian culture anymore. It's not even post-Christian. It's largely anti-Christian, becoming anti-Christian. And uh, there are many, many people that, that, that know nothing about Christianity at all in the States, and even more so here. So consequently, you can't start, jump into a conversation thinking that the people have full understanding. Even if they un understand the meanings of your words, they don't understand the sense of what you're talking about. Not only that, we have lots and lots of people that are writing aggressively now um, in, in, in attacking Christianity and everything that, that we stand for. You have the New Atheists. Uh, uh, you have uh, people like Bart Ehrman who are uh, writing against the, the authority of the Bible. Uh, now, it's not that everybody's reading this, but they know this kind of stuff is out there. And they, and they think, well, the smart people don't believe in this, because these guys are smart, they're academics, they're popular, you hear them on the radio, TV, half of them have British accents, so uh, that makes them even more persuasive. <laughs> Some of you maybe don't know this, but if you go to the States and you have a foreign accent, especially a British accent, people think, already think that you know what you're talking about, you know, so. Um, so this is a, you know, this is a problem, this is a, a difficulty 
I understand it doesn't work that way in reverse, like when Yanks come over here, you know, we don't, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, so all of these are, are kind of obstacles in the way. And so therefore, there's, a, there's a, a much greater need for what Francis Schaeffer used to call pre-evangelism. One other thing, and, and I, I know that if I went to, to the States and, and I went to teach a class in evangelism, and we had a lot of people there to encourage them to get out and to, to share their faith. And the goal in mind, even implicitly, is that we want to get you out there and you win people to Christ. So you, you close the sale. You know, you, uh, uh, you win the person to Christ. Well, if that's what the expected goal of any conversation is going to be, I know what will happen with this people in, the cl people in the class. They'll listen, and they'll take notes, and they'll smile, and they'll say, praise the Lord, and then they won't do it. And the reason they won't do it is the idea of trying to sit down with somebody and engage them and win them to Christ is frightening. It makes them uncomfortable. They're afraid that maybe there's going to be conflict. And this is, I understand this. I'm sympathetic to that. So about 15 years ago, I really had a shift in my thinking. I shifted from an evangelism mentality to an ambassador mentality. Now tomorrow I'm going to give a couple of sessions on what it means to be an ambassador for Christ, knowledge, wisdom, character, three qualities, and I've developed that. But let's just say for our purposes today, it, it changed the... the the goal that I had for my conversations. And now when I, when I do a, a, a bit of lecturing, uh, most of my teaching is, is with Christians and training, but I, I've been in 70 college and university campuses and I talk with some regularity to non-Christian audiences. When I do, I always start the same way. I identify, I identify myself as a follower of Christ, very briefly, and then I tell the audience, but I'm not here to convert you today. <laughs> it's almost like you can feel a sigh, a sigh of relief. Uh, I have a, a more modest goal. I said, I just want to put a stone in your shoe. <laughs> I just want to annoy you in a good way. Now, they expect the Christian to annoy them. I say, okay, I'll, I'm going to annoy you, but it'll be good. I, I want to get you thinking. That's the goal. I want you walking out of here after I'm done with my lecture or whatever, um, Annoyed in a good way about something I've said. And the reason is, is I am convinced that Jesus of Nazareth and the way he saw the world is worth thinking about. And then I get into my presentation, whatever it happens to be. But see, this is my goal. And it's not just my goal for that lecture. It's my goal for any conversation. When I sit down on an airplane and there I start to get into a conversation with somebody, um, I, I'm not trying to lead them to Christ. I realize that I am one player in a whole team that God is going to use in any person's life. I'm just one link in the chain. I'm going to give one piece. Now, it might be that the harvest is, is ready right then. It usually isn't. Usually, the, uh, before any harvest, there's always got to be a season of gardening. And lately, that season in people's lives is a lot longer because it's more difficult, like I said, to bring people to a point where they're ready to make a decision. So I never assume anybody's ready unless they let me know in the process of conversation, I get a sense of it. Now, some people wonder, well, wait a minute, do you ever get to the gospel in your style, in your method? <laughs> and I say, yeah, I get to the gospel. Well, when do you get to the gospel? And here's my answer. I get to the gospel whenever I want. And what I mean by that is, I feel free to give what I think is necessary for that person in the moment. And sometimes that isn't the full gospel. Maybe that isn't any part of the gospel. Maybe there's something that's in the way that's, that's keeping them from even thinking seriously about the gospel to begin with. And so I'm going to provide some of that to kind of soften the soil, to plant a seed of doubt in their minds, uh, just to get them thinking. And if I can get them thinking, they're walking out thinking, scratching their head, fine, I'm happy, 
I've done my job. But that, that, that isn't my, my role even just for an audience. It's every day living with people. And so I want to pass this on to you for your consideration as a goal. Don't try to cover all the ground. See what's available at the moment that you can do. Think of Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Paul said, conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders. Make the most of the opportunity. Let your, your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that, so that you know how to respond to each person. And this is, the, this is really what I'm getting at. Everybody has, is in a different place. You want to be sensitive to where they are at. So you want to be able to kind of gear your conversation to the need of the moment. Now, this is going to be a lot easier for you to do if you have a plan. And I want to talk about that plan today. That's why this talk is called Tactics. Now, I have written a book about tactics, and the book is titled Tactics. Makes, makes it easy. <laughs> I also wrote a book on relativism, and... Uh, the title of that book is um, Relativism. <laughs> Both were available down in the bookstore. I don't know if they are still. But the subtitle of the tactics book is A Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions. A Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions. And this is a game plan that is uh, hopefully going to allow you um, to stay in the driver's seat of a conversation. So here's what I'd like to do in the remaining time we have. And, and like it was said, I, I, I'm really abbreviating so we can have more interactive time. But I want to sketch out a game plan for you that will allow you to converse with confidence in any situation, no matter how little you know no matter how new you are or how, how knowledgeable or aggressive the other person happens to be. It's, it is a game plan that takes into consideration the Colossians chapter 4 um, principle there. You know, season your words with salt, make the best of the opportunity, conduct yourself with wisdom, know how to respond to each person. And it is a game plan that is designed to keep you in the driver's seat of the conversation. To put you in control of the conversation in an artful fashion. All right? So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, usually right now, this time of year, I'm in northern Wisconsin in the States fishing. In fact, on my phone, the last couple of days, one of my buddies from Wisconsin has been sending me his pictures of the fish he's catching while I'm here in Poland with you. He's annoying me. Because I like to fish, and we have some property in northern Wisconsin. I grew up in the Chicago area, and when I was a kid, we used to go up there, and now I, I go up there with my family, my own girls. And, uh, but I usually go up early by myself or my brother or buddy, and then we just fish like crazy. And this particular year, about 10 years ago, I went up and I caught... I fish for smallmouth bass. I don't think you have those here in, in Europe, but, but at, at this particular day out, I caught the largest smallmouth bass that I ever caught, which is four pounds and two ounces. I don't know what that is in liters, what? Meters? Um, no, let's see. Kilograms. Okay, see, there you go. I'm American. What do I know? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like a, you know, one of those things. But it was a big fish, and so I got a photograph of it, and uh, um, I was out with a local pastor, and I wanted to put this photo on the, on the wall. I, I'm sorry, I wanted to get it digitized so I could put it up on the screen at his church the next Sunday where I was going to be preaching and show people what a fisherman I was. So there was a woman that was at the desk there, and I was there with my wife, and we dropped our film off because it was before our digital days, and she had a, she had a, um, a five-point star hanging from her neck, a piece of jewelry. 
which is an occultic symbol in many cases. But I, I saw it and I asked her about it. I said, does, does that, that uh, jewelry have religious significance? And, and she said, yes, the five points stand for earth, wind, fire, water, and spirit. Okay, so now this is becoming clear. And I said, well, I'm curious. Some people wear crosses and it doesn't mean anything to them. What does it have religious significance for you personally, or is it just jewelry? And she said, uh, yes, it does have significance. I, I'm a pagan. Now, my wife was with me, and my wife isn't used to these kinds of conversations. And so when the woman said that she was a pagan, this caught my wife by surprise, and she started laughing. Ah, you know, I was like, <laughs> But then she stopped, and she was embarrassed, and she said, I'm sorry, I didn't need to be rude. I, I, just, I just never heard anybody admit it before, is what my wife said. She'd only heard the word pagan when her girlfriends would call their kids in. Get in here, you bunch of pagans, you know, that kind of thing. So... Um, <clears throat> but this, uh, the woman did not take offense and, and uh, began to explain that it, this was an earth religion. And uh, suddenly I realized I'm, I'm talking with a witch. And in fact, I asked her, are you Wiccan? She said, yes. And then she got, went on to explain, we, we Wiccan, we, we um, respect all life. And I said, well, if you respect all life, that would probably make you pro-life then with regards to abortion. Right? And she said, well, actually, no, I'm pro-choice. I said, really? Isn't that odd for a, a witch to be pro-choice? And, and this is my understanding, that most witches are pro-life because of their own theology. And she said, yeah, it is kind of. And then she said this. She qualified it. She said, you know, I, I could never do that, referring to abortion. I could never do that. I could never kill a baby. Now, um, at Stand to Reason, we teach on abortion. We train how to have discussions on this, and we make the case that abortion takes the life of an innocent human being without proper justification. Baby killing, if you will, but we don't use that language because we don't want people to think we are trying to muscle them with rhetoric, so we don't call it baby killing. But I'm not the one who's using that phrase now. She's the one who's using the baby killing language. So if, if you get nothing else out of our session today, I hope you really get the conviction that you have to pay attention to what people are saying because they're going to give you things in conversation that's going to help you. She was the one who called it baby killer. So am I going to keep, to, as we discuss more about abortion, am I going to refer to abortion now? No, I'm going to use a different term. I'm going to use the term she just gave me. I'm going to talk about baby killing because she's introduced the term into the conversation. And what she said was, she said, I know I could never do that. I could never kill a baby. And then gave the reason why. I wouldn't want something bad to come back on me. Kind of like a karma thing, I guess. What goes around comes around. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a really odd reason not to want to kill babies. I'm not going to kill any baby. You never know what's going to happen to you when you start killing babies. I mean, that seems kind of silly to me. Maybe we should just not kill babies regardless. But I didn't pursue that. I, I, I uh, instead, I said, well, maybe you won't kill babies, but we should stop other people from killing babies. And she said, well, you know, I think people should have a choice. Now, what is the choice that we're talking about here? On her own admission, the choice to do what? To kill babies. And that's what I asked her. You mean people should have a choice to kill babies? And she said, well, I think all things should be taken into consideration. I said, okay, what would be a a legitimate consideration to make it okay to kill a baby. And she immediately said incest. Okay, now let me step back for a moment. You, you, I want you to see what's going on here. We're, we're having this conversation, and, and what she is doing is she is trotting out all of these pro-choice slogans. She's just giving the party line here, okay? But the difference is she has already identified abortion as baby killing. So now all of the, of the slogans that she's trotting out are justifications for baby killing. And it's starting to sound weird. But she doesn't realize that because she's not paying attention. She's just given the lines, which is something that Christians do a lot too. We get socialized to say certain things and we just rattle this stuff off. And we're not really thinking about whether we're actually making sense in the context of the conversation. So I said, let me ask you if I understand your view here. Let me, let me ask, I want to know how you respond to this. 
Let's just say, because she says that uh, incest is a legitimate reason to kill babies. What if I had a two-year-old standing next to me? Now, at that time, I didn't have any children. I have a six and a two. I have a, what do I have now? I have a nine and a six now, uh, both daughters. Uh, and, but, but, you know, I'm an old guy. Two weeks, I turn, on, turn 64, so uh, you can pray for me, please. But um, I said, what if I had a, a, a two-year-old standing next to me? And that two-year-old had been conceived by incest. On your view, I should be allowed to kill this baby. Is that right? Now, let me ask you a question. Was that a fair application of her view? Yes, yes it was. And in fact, I'm giving her an opportunity. If I misunderstood, she can correct me right now. But she did not correct me because I understood her view. It was a fair application. And she paused there, and she began to think now. And maybe this is when I put a stone in her shoe. I don't know. Because you never really know about these kind of things. What you could do is take the best tactic possible. You lay it out there, and then you trust God to do what he's going to do. I mean, that's all you can do. No, no magic bullet here, all right? And, and she's thinking about it. And finally, she said, she's, when I asked her if it's okay to kill the baby because of incest, the two-year-old, she said... Well, I'd have mixed feelings about that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I hope so. At least mixed feelings, you know. Uh, now, she said that as a concession to me. It was like, well, you, you know, you got a point there. But she wasn't ready to give the whole thing out. Now, as it turned out, the line is starting to build behind me, the queue. It, and Because we're at a commercial establishment. And um, if... And, and I realize that as an ambassador, my opportunity has come to an end. And I am emotionally free to move on because of my approach. Now, had I been of a different persuasion about these things, I might have said, wow, uh, folks, I haven't gotten to the gospel yet. Sit down. You might, you know, listen up. Maybe you'll learn something. But I didn't do that. I just entrusted that woman to the Lord, finished my business, and move on. Now, <clears throat> I want you to notice something about this conversation. In this conversation, I used nine different questions. I used questions to introduce the conversation, to start things going. I used questions to, um, to gather more information from her about her point of view. I even used questions to help her to see maybe a weakness or a flaw in her, her point of view. I used questions to make a point when I, I trotted out the toddler. I brought the baby out, you know, as an illustration, the, uh, the two-year-old. And in my notes right now, it says here, I'm supposed to say to you, and, and she was doing most of the work. Uh, but then I, like, I'm doing a little work and she's doing more of the work, you know, in the conversation because it wasn't hard for me to do this. And then I realized as I'm looking at my notes, I, I, I said, no, she, she wasn't doing most of the work. I scratched most of it. And I put the word all in there. She's doing all the work because I wasn't working. I was relaxed. I was calm. I was collected. There was no pressure on me. And I thought about it for a moment. I thought, well, wait a minute. That was true of her, too. I wasn't doing any work. She wasn't doing any work. I scratched that off, too. Neither of us were working in a certain sense. Okay. Um, there was no lines drawn in the sand. We weren't defending turf. We were just having a conversation. No raised voices, no tension. And this is exactly the way I want it. This is key to the tactical approach. This is key to being a good ambassador. Now, at Stan Therese, we have a lot of different tactics, and if you pick up the book, and I hope you do sooner or later, um, it's done really well on the market because it's helped a lot of people. This is a, a continuous feedback that I get. Um, and we have tactics that have odd names like suicide and taking the roof off and just the facts, ma'am, and uh, road scholar and steamroller, and these are words that are meant to capture mentally the, the tactic and help you remember it. But there is one tactic that I use more than any other tactic uh, that is, the, is really at the heart of the game plan. And it's the easiest tactic to use to stop an objector in their tracks 
to turn the tables and to get them thinking, and that tactic is called Columbo. <laughs> now, maybe this name doesn't mean much to many of you, but I see some people smiling because Columbo is an American TV character from about 30 years ago who was a detective who wore a trench coat and smoked a cigar and was, uh, did, he looks like he was, he's stupid, but he's stupid like a fox because he would, he would ask questions in a way that made people relaxed, but he'd get his information and then he'd get his man or woman as the case may be, the murderer, you know, he'd solve the crime. And, and so he is the model really for the, 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 the game plan I just want to sketch out for you. Uh, Columbo is our game plan. That is a question asking game plan. And it is a game plan that allows us uh, to maneuver easily uh, using, well, Columbo can be used three different ways. I've already hinted at some of them, but I'm going to uh, briefly develop two ways. And then if you want the third way, you're going to have to get the book or come to the thing on Thursday or whatever. But um, we'll sketch this out and then we'll have some conversation. Okay. Um, the first way that you use Columbo is to gather information. So I want you to think about this. When you, you encounter a circumstance where you'd like to have an impact for Christ, all right, um, you have to get more information before you can know how to proceed. I, you know, whether I'm sitting on the plane next to somebody or in a supermarket or buying groceries or at a restaurant talking with somebody or at an event with friends that maybe don't know the Lord, um, I have to gather more information. Because if I don't, it, it's like going into a battle without having a map of the terrain. If you don't have a map, then you don't know, you can't even begin to know how to prosecute your, 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 uh, your enterprise. And so w when you ask questions, it's friendly because you're drawing other people out. You're, you're finding out more about them. When you're asking questions, you ask the question, then the other person is doing the talking, so the pressure's not on you. When you're asking questions, there's nothing for you to defend. You're not pushing anything. You're just, you're just interested in other people, okay? So um, the first thing that you want to start doing is you want to start gathering information. And the kind of question, I'm going to give you a model question for the first two uses of Columbo. The first question uh, is some form of the question, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Now this takes a lot of different forms. If I'm doing a Q&A at a university after I've given a, a lecture, uh, I'm going to get skeptics, atheists coming back at me, which is fine. But it's amazing how often people make challenges to Christianity and they're, they're vague. And sometimes the success of the challenge trades on the ambiguity. That is, the more ambiguous it is, the more effective it sounds as a challenge. How about this one? Everything's relative. Well, that's a challenge to us. You know, we talk about truth. Now they're saying everything's relative. I had a student come up to me once and say, how do I answer that, how do I answer that, uh, that argument? And I said, well, it's not an argument. It's just a point of view, first of all. Secondly, it's vague. I would never try to answer that. I'd want to know, what do you mean by that? Simple question. Now, uh, two words, everything's relative. What, what word or words might be vague? How about relative? What does the person mean by relative? I know what relativism is. I wrote a book about it. Well, it's not up there yet, but, but that doesn't mean he knows what it is. I want to know what they think relative means. All right. Um, what do you mean by everything? Because listen, if, if everything means everything, and everything is relative, isn't the statement everything is relative part of everything? Which would make the statement itself what? Also relative, whatever that means. So now you can see there's a problem. By the way, some of you are beginning to see just the power of the question just at this point. Everything's relative. Really? What, what do you... You start asking this, now who's on the defensive? Me? Well, no. And actually, they're not on the defensive because it's not a challenge. It's just a query. It's just a question. Help me out. I need more information before I can respond to what you had to say. 
And here's a little secret about this. When you ask for more information, what do you mean by that? You will be amazed at how often people come back with silence. Just be prepared for it. Because it, it, they often have not thought about what they mean by these things. So don't help them out. Don't jump back in. Just ask your question and wait. May, let them do some of the hard work of thinking through this, okay? Sometimes they have not offered a challenge, uh, but, they, but, but you're just opening in a situation. You just meet the person. Well, then you're, what do you mean by that? Questions are going to be more general, and you're just drawing that person out. I was sitting next to a young man on an airplane. I, I, as I'm just drawing him out, I learned that he's, a, 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 he, he's not a Christian. Uh, he saw me reading my Bible there on the plane, and so he knew I was a Christian, but he's not a Christian. And um, he asked me what I did for a living, and I think that's how we got into that part of the conversation. But then he said, uh, he said, I used to be a Christian, but I'm not anymore. Do you think that's good information to have? Then he says, I used to be a preacher's kid. How do you used to be a preacher's kid? Did your dad die? And he said, no, my dad didn't die. He's not a preacher anymore. And in fact, he's not a Christian anymore. Oh, do you think there's any emotional baggage regarding Christianity sitting next to me? Absolutely. Can you imagine if I had just jumped in with a simple gospel? His response would have been, uh, been there, done that, and it hurt. Thanks, but no thanks. No, but instead, I just listen, and he's pouring his heart out, and he's talking about these things, and now I'm getting a kind of a mental picture of a map of his spiritual life, and now I know there are mines, landmines, and I can maneuver carefully, okay? So there, there is so much more I'd like to be able to say about, about just about this, the use of the first question. What do you mean by that? But uh, I'm just going to suggest to you, try to use this all the time, in your conversations with people. It's just simply good manners. You meet somebody, you begin drawing them out. But in this case, you're going to be drawing them out with a mind to listening for an opening that you might pursue with another question to take you closer to spiritual things. And if you're already in a conversation about spiritual things, you want to draw that person out to get a more clear idea about what they actually believe. Okay, so this is the first Columbo question. What do you mean by that? And do you use that question to gather information? Now, think about this. You can do that all day long, and there's never any pressure on you. All you seem like is a nice, friendly person taking interest in someone else. And you wait until you find your opening, and then you start moving maybe more specifically. Sometimes the opening doesn't present itself, then you don't go anywhere. So, um, toy with that idea. Let me move quickly to the second use of Columbo. The second use of Columbo I'm going to call this reversing the burden of proof. Reversing the burden of proof. Okay? Now, um, the burden of proof is the responsibility someone in a conversation has to give reasons or evidence for a point of view, right? You probably know this. Um, who is it that bears this responsibility in any conversation? Who bears the burden of proof in any conversation? And here's the basic rule. The person who makes the claim bears the burden of proof, all right? The person who makes the claim bears the burden. So if, especially if it's controversial. So if you make a controversial statement, like everything's relative, it is not the job of the other person to refute your view. It is that person's job, or your job if you make that claim, to defend the view first. So if you make a claim it is your job to defend your claim first, all right? Now, the reason I point this out is because in a lot of conversations, the non-Christian makes a controversial claim against Christianity. And whether it's a good one or bad one, I'm not even uh, dealing with that. I'm just saying they make this challenge against Christianity, okay? Um, and then the Christian feels like it is their job 
to refute that claim. Oh, now I have to show that everything's not relative, that, that the truth is objective or absolute in some sense. And there are ways to do that, and you might be able to attempt that if successfully even, but I'm just simply saying there's a better way to approach it. Why give the other person a free ride? Why let them off with just being able to say whatever they want, and then you have to do all the work to try to disprove them? Don't they have some explaining to do here in the conversation? I think so. And since the basic rule is whoever makes the claim bears the burden, why not require of that other person an accounting of their view? Why not have them give us reasons for what they, they said? That's the second use of Columbo, to reverse the burden of proof back on the person who is actually making the claim. And you can do that with a simple question. And that question is some variation of, now how did you come to that conclusion? How did you come to that conclusion? Or what are your reasons for that view? Or what makes you think that's the way it is? Now one of the reasons that this step is so important is because there are lots of times people will come up with alternate explanations for things. And they have a feeling like all they have to do is put the alternate explanation out there and they've won. And they'll say like, I can explain that. So for example, you might be talking to a materialist, naturalist, atheist, skeptic of some sort about, um, about the design in the universe and how the universe has this incredible design and how unlikely it is, given the, uh, the design parameters, I mean, all the things that are intricately designed, the fine-tuned constants of the universe, which, by the way, is a very powerful argument. And lots of skeptics have, been, have, been, have, have, have acknowledged that this is a, really hard to deal with. But then you'll have somebody say, well, look, at when you have an infinite number of universes available that are randomly that are randomly constructed, you, of course you're going to get one that looks fine-tuned. We just happen to be here to look at the one. So I can explain that. Off they go. Well, usually they think they've finished the job then just because they've, what have they done? They've told a story. They have another step to make. And the other step is to give the reasons why they're convinced there are an infinite number of universes and that they are randomly generated. How did you come to that conclusion? The evidence for the multiverse is zero. There are some scientific theories that provide for the possibility, but it's just in their theory. It's just in their story. There, there can't be empirical evidence even in principle for multiverse. And so this is where instead of being, uh, because we can't get into other universes to measure them, is the point. We're locked into our universe. We don't even know the physics are the same in other universes, so why? Even arguments from physics that seem to me to be limited. But the point is, is that you, you can't just say multiverse and the problem goes away. It's like saying, where did, the, where did the presents come from on Christmas? Santa Claus. Oh, okay, all right. No, I think you've got to do a little bit more than that. And so uh, at this point, it's fair to ask the question, how did you come to that conclusion? So again, we are shifting the burden onto the person who is making the claim, and we are asking of them for an accounting. Now, keep in mind that... Just like with the first question, you ask the question, what do you mean by that? You might get silence. You're going to get silence a lot of times with the second question because your question assumes that they've actually come to a conclusion by working through some line of thinking when that is rarely the case with your rank and file person. People are just repeating what they've heard. And so if you ask them, how did you come to that conclusion? You're going to get a blank stare. What are your reasons for that? I, I've had people tell me, well, I don't have any reasons for that. So I got another question. Why would you believe something that you have no reasons to believe? 
And they said, I don't have any reasons for that either. <laughs> So now I'm giving you, I'm just coming to an end here. We're going to have some interaction in a moment. But I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a very thin sketch of a game plan, of a way of engaging, of, of, of having conversation with people in a, in a relaxed kind of fashion. So there's no pressure. Where you're not doing most of the talking, yet the other person is doing most of the talking. You're drawing them out in a polite way. Your goal is not to win them to Christ. Your goal is to see if there's an opportunity to put a stone in their shoe. And you're going to accomplish that goal by drawing them out, by asking information questions, gathering information. And if they start making claims, you get clarity on what those claims are, and then you ask for their reasons for their claims. Again, you're in a very passive role here. By the way, that is the core of the game plan that will allow you, I mean, it sounds like, well, wait, isn't there more than that? Well, this is really the core. Remember I promised you earlier I'd give you a game plan that will allow you to converse with confidence in any situation, no matter how little you know or how aggressive or knowledgeable the other person happens to be? This is it. You ask these two questions, you, you, can, you can maneuver anywhere. And as you're asking the questions, you're the ones who are in charge of the conversation. If you're asking the questions, you're in the driver's seat. You're directing it where you want to go. Now, there's a third use of Columbo, and I'm just going to mention it briefly. And then I'll open it up for Q&A, interaction. And the third use of Columbo is to make a point using questions. You use questions to make a point. You lead people somewhere, okay? It might be that you notice that there's a problem in the point of view that's just been, been expressed. But instead of pointing it out directly, you're going to use a question to help that person to see the difficulty. Okay? So, um, remember my conversation with the, um, the witch in Wisconsin? She said that um, incest was a good reason, a legitimate reason to kill a baby. So what did I do? I, I asked, let, I said, let me see if I understand you. What if I had a two-year-old standing here? On your view, it sounds like it would be okay to kill this child. Is that correct? So now I am using a question to give an example of the consequence of her view, basically, and I'm throwing it back in her lap and asking her for her response to that. So I'm using a question now to, to uh, exploit uh, what I think is a weakness or a flaw in her view. That would be a way of using a um, question in the third way, to make a point. Sometimes the point you're going to make is to explain your own point of view. But it's best to try to explain your view if you can by using questions, which is allows the other person to contribute something to the conversation. Now tonight you're going to, I'm going to be at the, at the plenary session and uh, I'll give more, you'll see examples of that mixed in with my talk as I tell about some circumstances that, uh, that I experienced as a, to make the points that I'll be making tonight. But I'm going to be using these questions to move through uh, a, a, a defense of uh, the cosmological argument, for example. That's going to be one of the things that I, I talk about. I'm going to talk about the, the problem of evil and, and uh, the moral argument for God, but you're going to see, watch how I use questions to maneuver. In all of those cases, I'm using questions in the third way of Columbo. I'm using them uh, to make a point, but I'm getting the other person's participation in the conversation as I'm asking the questions. All right. So now what I've done is I've given you a, a ridiculously thin overview of the, of the tactical approach. There's a lot more to it. And of course, there are more tactics as well. The Colombo tactic is the game plan. The other tactics, like suicide and taking the roof off, the others that I mentioned, these are brought in, these are maneuvers in conversation that can be brought in to service the, the basic core game plan in which col the Colombo tactic is 
is what you're using to move forward in, in conversation. And remember, our goal is to, 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 to take advantage of the circumstance that God gives us and not to try to push too far. We're not going to try to give too much information. We're not going to try to cover too much ground in any, at any given point. I became a Christian as an adult. And so um, uh, it, it took me a while to work through the issues before I was ready to make a decision for Christ. And, uh, and a person like that takes a little bit at a time and thinks about it then moves on to the next stage. So there's your sketch of the tactical game plan. 